Hello everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's town hall, California Architects' Role in Climate Resiliency, brought to you by the AIA Climate California Climate Action Resilient Design Committee and the Urban Design Committee. Today's town hall will include a brief introduction to the program, presentations from our speakers, a moderated town hall discussion, and final thoughts and takeaways from today's program. Please use the Q&A function to ask any questions for today's presenters. You can also like a question to move it to the top of the queue. If you would like to ask a question to a specific presenter, please include their name in the beginning of your question so we can address them directly during the town hall discussion segment. Questions that are not answered in today's town hall can be made available on our website, www.aiacalifornia.org. Today's program qualifies for 1.5 AIA HSW learning units for those who stay on and watch live. AIA California staff will report these units for you, and they should appear in your transcript in the coming weeks. The program is also being recorded and we will be posted on the AIA California website, along with a PDF copy of the presentation and any additional resources. I would now like to introduce today's town hall moderator, Tian Feng, FAIA, FCSI. Over a decade ago, Tian initiated BART's climate resiliency work in partnership with federal and state agencies. He was the principal investigator and lead author of the BART Climate Action Adaptation Assessment Pilot, funded and published by the U.S. Federal Transit Administration in 2014. With support from FHWA, Tian has collaborated with Caltrans and the Metropolitan Transportation Commission in addressing sea level rise adaptation for Bay Area's transportation systems in 2016. Tian served as a research advisor to Resilient by Design Bay Area Challenges in 2017 and was a steering committee member at San Francisco Bay Area Regional Coastal Hazards Adaptation Resiliency Group since 2018. He is currently a leadership advisory group member for the Bay ADAPT Joint Platform with the Bay Conservation and Development Commission. Tian is a member of the AIA National Resilient and Adaptation Advisory Group and is founding co-chair of the AIA California Resilient Design Committee. And now I pass it off to Tian Feng. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you for uh, beginning with this good introduction of uh, this is AIA program and opening up the town hall. I would like to begin with thanking uh, the audience who attended with us. And I want to especially thank uh, to those who are not AI members. Uh, welcome, join us. So briefly, a few words about AIA. Established in 1857, the American Institute of Architects, AIA, with chapters in the United States and worldwide, has been a leading force in creation of livable and sustainable built environment in America and worldwide. Since 1967, AIA California has been in the forefront of shaping and designing buildings and communities for the health, safety, and welfare of Californians. Next. I like speak a little bit about the Resilient Design Committee and the Urban Design Committee of California AIA. California has been experiencing intensified impact from climate change to our buildings and communities. These impacts have created both challenges and opportunities for California architects in many ways, design processes, stakeholder engagement, code and regulations, stand of care, and even professional liabilities. It is a common goal of the Resilient Design Committee and the Urban Design Committee to become a resource to the California architects and allied professionals in address, uh, address resilient design in California. That is really the reason behind that we work together and uh, put this forward for the dialogue to happen today. This town hall entitled California Architects' Role in Climate Resiliency. Next one. So a little about 
about the town halls. Um, we have two parts that designed for you. The part one is we have speakers to showcase their expertise in climate resiliency and their experience in resilient design. That is, you can say, see the first three speakers here. They will cover broad spectrum of topics relates to the resiliency and resilient design. And uh, this section two is, which is open to the audience and to have a facilitated dialogue with the speakers in addressing what is the California architect's role in climate resiliency. And we do not, speakers and myself have not brought in a definition or an answer to this topic. It is the purpose of this town halls, engage such a discussion. And hopefully as we walk away, we'll have some grapple, something to grapple with to understand how architects will define or shape our role in this movement. So with that, I like briefly highlight the three speakers topic. So first of all, we are very pleased to have a lead staff from governor's office of office and planning. Um, we can go back to a slide, uh, Sarah. And then, then we will hear a more broad perspective of what the California has done in this process, anywhere from legislative, legislative context to, to policy framework and the resource that is available to California communities. And then we're followed by our own expert, a member from AIA California, that to address the urban wildlife uh, resilient design and to protect California housing stocks. And his very, very intimate personal experience of how we develop a code to translate these lessons learned from natural disasters to, um, to uh, codification of actual resilient design and uh, to resist the urban wildfires. And then we were followed by a unique voice from different continent. We have Dutch architect here to share his experience, which he devoted his career in address that resilient design. And we will hear that um, as, as um, you know, capstone of this speak session. And then we then kick off the town hall I have just mentioned. Okay. So with that said, I like to introduce Nguyen Tara He. She is the deputy director for the climate resilience at the governor's office of research and planning uh, known as OPR. So we will use OPR. Uh, Nguyen Tara is also um, the chair for the technical advisory uh, council for the integrated climate adaptation resiliency program. So prior to join OPR, Nguyen Tara co-founded the international initiative that is community-based climate action and has worked in public, private, and non-profit sectors on sustainable urban and regional planning and focus on social equity and climate change. Her area of expertise include sustainable urban development, climate change mitigation and planning, and climate impact assessment and GHG accounting. Uh, it also involved with the, um, a good governance and strategic planning and organizational development. She has master's degree of urban and regional planning from Portland State University and a BA from Louis and Clark College. And with that said, I'd like to introduce um, Nguyen Tara, give us 
uh, her presentation first, then I will introduce other speakers. You and Tara. Great. Thank you all so much for the invitation to be here. I'm going to um, I'm going to share my screen here. So one second while I pull up my slides. Great. So um, if hopefully you see the pre presentation mode here. Yes. Great. So thank you all so much for the opportunity to be here. As was mentioned, I'm new in Tara Key. I'm deputy director for climate resilience in the governor's office of planning and research. And I just want to start with the, you know, a thank you for the invitation to be a part of this conversation with the American Institute of Architects California chapter to discuss our work in California on building resilience. And I look forward to sharing um, insight and then joining the conversation after the presentations here. So just to provide some context, I'm gonna frame out, as was mentioned, some of the um, regulatory and legislative context here in California on climate. And as I think everybody is uh, well aware, California has played a very strong leadership role nationally and internationally in um, climate mitigation policy, programs, funding, you know, really leading the way in charting ambitious emissions reductions, goals, um, laws, and policies and programs. And, you know, as we've been continuing to lead on emissions reductions and meeting ambitious um, carbon um, neutrality and carbon emissions reduction goals, we also recognize that the impacts of a changing climate are already here and they are already impacting communities on the ground across the state. And so for this administration, it is, um, you know, we've really been driving on what we call an integrated approach on climate, which is elevating adaptation and resilience and mitigation as equal parts to our climate agenda here in California. So big picture, just want to frame out, you know, as we're thinking about driving on um, emissions reductions and adaptation, really framing that as part of our you know, comprehensive and integrated climate agenda here in California. I'm going to point out here just, and as you all can see on the right side of the screen, a little bit of context now in our office's role, the Governor's Office of Planning and Research on climate resilience specifically. So through our office, we run the Integrated Climate Adaptation and Resiliency Program, which was established through statute, Senate Bill 246, to serve as um, a really a hub for alignment and coordination on climate resilience policy and implementation efforts. So what that means in practice is working across and with our state agency partners, but really looking at how do we support implementation and how do we make sure that the right partners are at the table across scales and across sectors to really be supporting local implementation on the ground. Another important role that our office plays um, is through another bill, Senate Bill 1320, which um, requires the California climate change assessments be implemented every five years. And so really pointing to the importance that science-based policy and research plays in California in the context of our climate work as well. And then another piece of um, important kind of statutory direction and um, legislative context here in California is that California is required to update the state climate adaptation strategy every three years. And uh, that is a really important uh, framework and framing um, structure that we have in California on resilience and adaptation that I'm going to speak to a little bit more here in a minute. So that's just kind of big picture summary. There's um, obviously lots of additional legislative and policy frameworks out there, but just wanting to give a little bit of an overview on the resilience space and, and where our office fits in the state um, role on resilience. So moving here to kind of a vision for Resilient California, I thought it would be helpful to frame out kind of big picture how we approach resilience 
in California from a state perspective and really recognizing that we take a holistic view on resilience and that we're really driving towards um, an approach that recognizes building resilience requires you know resilience in communities and building social um, resilience it also means supporting natural systems and thinking about adaptation and resilience measures in our um, natural and systems and maintaining functioning ecosystems and it also means building resilience of our built infrastructure within the context of the built infrastructure, making sure that our systems can withstand and thrive in the change um, in context of a changing climate. So just wanted to frame out here too, before I kind of dive in um, in the next couple slides here around how we are really trying to drive on a holistic and integrated kind of whole of community approach on resilience from the state perspective. So for the rest of my presentation here, I'm going to hit on four themes um, related to the state's resilience, approach on resilience and, and our work here, um, really organized around the first, which is that you know, climate impacts, as I mentioned before, are already um, happening and they serve as a threat multiplier and adaptation actions need to be grounded in actionable climate science. The second is that resilience building requires a whole of community and whole of government approach. And I'll quickly highlight how the state's climate adaptation strategy is driving on that, um, really driving and implementing and modeling that approach. The third is that our actions on climate mitigation and adaptation have to be integrated, again, driving on our integrated agenda that I mentioned at the top. And then fourth, all adaptation and resilience efforts require a commitment to equitable adaptation outcomes within communities. So here for the um, first theme to kind of set the stage here for our resilience work, um, we are really driving, as I mentioned at the top, on this science to action agenda, really recognizing that communities uh, need a, the information around what does future climate risk look like in California and how do we then not just have that science, but how do we translate that into our decision making, whether that's long range planning, individual site design, you know, investment decisions, really making sure that we're thinking about future climate risk and operationalizing that within our decision making as we're investing in and taking adaptation actions. So I want to highlight the you know, value of California's climate change assessment, which California is the only state in the country that actually has its own climate assessment as we do, um, very much an analog to the national and international assessments, is really about providing best science, but also importantly, translating that to inform decision making and meet many stakeholder needs. Now moving to the second theme here around accelerating collective action, the 2021 update to the state climate adaptation strategy, as I mentioned before, is really driving on our whole of government approach by building resilience and reducing risk, really by changing kind of a, a shifting a paradigm shift here in terms of how we're framing our adaptation resilience work through the strategy by organizing that really important state strategy around outcomes. This is the first time this state adaptation strategy is organized around a series of priorities and priority outcomes as opposed to individual sectors. And so this is you know, a really exciting um, update to the strategy. The other important addition um, that we've made in this 2021 update is for the first time inclusion of time bound success metrics really looking at how do we track our progress over time as we're building resilience and investing in adaptation actions across the state. Moving to my third and fourth theme here, driving on an integrated climate agenda. Again, I touched on this at the top um, in my opening remarks here, but this is really fundamental to our approach on climate across the state um, and from a state perspective is really looking at Again, how do we chart ambitious emissions reductions while also adapting to the changing climate? And one of the key areas that we have been focused on in our office is providing 
guidance to state agencies on how to operationalize climate risk within planning and investment decisions. So for example, coming out of an executive order that was signed now a couple of years ago in 1919, we have been working to update our science guidance to really think about how do we bring climate risk, future climate risk into planning and design um, and investment decisions as the state. And then fourth um, here, the fourth theme, and very importantly, I will just wrap with a um, highlighting our commitment to equitable adaptation outcomes, recognizing that climate, as I mentioned before, is a force multiplier, but also exacerbates existing inequities within communities and within our systems. And so really looking at making sure that we're driving on equitable outcomes as we're thinking about and as core to our approach on adaptation. One example coming through our office is we are in the process of developing a platform that will help us better understand who is vulnerable to climate risks and why to be able to more strategically inform and guide policy and investment decisions on adaptation. So I'm just going to wrap here. My last couple slides are just a couple examples of um, the important role that design plays in building resilience and specifically thinking about um, the audience here today, you know, really that critical role that design plays. So um, as we know, or as we all I'm sure know, 2021 was the hottest summer on record in California. We you know, hit major um, unfortunate records in terms of hottest days ever recorded. And, you know, the best available science projects that this is going to become the norm and we will continue to see warming and increasing in extreme heat events. And we actually, the administration just released a draft extreme heat action plan, which is really organizing how we as the state are responding to this really urgent and important um, climate impact that we need to address. One of the actions that I just want to highlight that's in that action plan um, points specifically to the importance that um, design and not just um, design, but also how we maintain standards for our buildings, land use, and design elements, and really that critical role that that plays in adopting cooling, the adoption of cooling strategies for both indoor and outdoor environments. So, you know, really recognizing that design plays a critical role in um, addressing extreme heat. The next example that I um, am going to highlight is actually not a state example, but just highlighting some work that is coming out of um, the city of LA and through funding through a state grant program. Um, LA has just recently developed a toolkit for urban cooling strategies to explore how you know, they might address and be implemented to address extreme heat issues in LA. Um, this is a really exciting, you know, example of how, you know, we look at what are the design solutions and then providing actionable toolkits um, to think about how we scale those solutions in implementation of, um, on the ground. And then the third example here that I'm going to wrap with is, you know, just recognizing the importance the design plays in addressing other climate impacts in addition to extreme heat and recognizing the importance of design, resilient design in reducing wildfire, the impacts of and devastation of wildfire across the state. And you know, from the state perspective, wildfire resilience requires design considerations at the landscape community and structural scale. So just really recognizing the importance that um, the design community plays in helping us understand where um, we can be reducing risk and building adaptation measures in as we think about wildfire as well. And so with that, I'm going to wrap and just want to say thank you very much again. Um, that was a pretty you know, high level overview of a lot of work we have going on at the state and happy to hand it back to you and then transition to discussion um, later on in the course of the, the time here today. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nir and Tara. And also thank you for tee up our next conversation, which is about uh, extreme heat and wildfire.
And I wanted the audience to know, particularly AIA uh, California members, we pick these topics as based on our, our findings. Um, and uh, recently we have uh, put up a survey, ask a component to investigate what are the priority and what are top concerns that uh, our membership has in terms of uh, climate resiliency and uh, extreme heat and Wi-Fi is ranking on the top. So just so you know, we hear you and we uh, put forward the resource we have and uh, we want uh, response, uh, responding your concern with the event and other efforts like this. So with that said, I like to start to introduce Stephen Winko, our very own member of AIA California, uh, expert in many front. Um, so Steve manages Bay Area office of the preview group a firm that specializes in building code and accessibility consultation. He's a licensed architect, civil engineer, landscape architect, and a certified access specialist. Thank you, Stephen. Bring in four experts in one body. That's very <laughs> nice. Um, Steve was a board member of the National Institute of Building Science from 2009 to 2015. Steve served five terms as an architect member at California Building Standards Commission and also served as a vice chair. He's a member of the National AI Code and Standards Committee. He's an honorary member of the ICC with the voting privileges. Steve was active in developing and reviewing building code standards for the city of Oakland after the 1991 Oakland Hills firestorm. He was heavily involved in the review and adoption of the California State Fire Marshal's Wildland Urban Interface. I, I believe it's known as WUI, Steve, if you correct me if it's wrong, code requirement. Yes. Uh, now founded in California Building Code, Chapter 7A. Steve has served twice the, on the National Institute of Science Reviewing Panel, and he is the co-author of the Building Code Illustrated, and you can see the cover on the slides. With that said, Steve, please bring in your perspective about codification for resonant design against fire. Again, put in the context of these are key steps architects need to get involved to not just address the resilient design issues, but broadly to protect California's housing stock. You know, the housing is one of the biggest concerns of the state. Steve. Okay. Uh, the slideshow going here from the beginning. There we go. Is the show up? Yeah, go. there it is, Steve. Uh, I have about a 30 minute show I'm going to go through in 10 minutes. So um, things are going to go by very quickly in some cases, but you're going to get a copy of the slide deck um, about what we're doing. This is really about the resistance part of dealing with um, the wildland urban interface that, that Tian alluded to is basically where people really, people think of it as building in the woods, but it turns out that it, it has a much larger component to that than, um, than that. Um, this is codified now in 7A, as, uh, which is a unique national effort. The International Code Council is working on codifying wildland urban interface and they have their own code, but California has been a leader. Um, the key word to keep in mind about building code issues is the word intent. Is basically the intent here is to make housing that is in the wildland urban interface or adjacent to it 
have a higher survivability rate than things where you're not paying attention to building in that environment. The other thing about codes to keep in mind is that somebody thinks about a code problem, translates that physical problem into words. An architect then reads the words, translate that into a drawing, turns the drawing back into the building department, who then translates the drawings back into words and tells you whether you're code compliant or not. It's like the game of rumor where you do a circle and you get around and the story is different when you get to the beginning. Um, no wonder people have code problems because there's so many translation elements. Um, the problem is, as you can see on the right-hand photograph, is that this is the wildland urban interface, but the problem is that it's full of houses. It's not just a single house in the woods. It's a large number of houses that are encroaching on um, landscape, which is increasingly dry. And given the history of fire suppression efforts in the United States, increasingly heavily vegetated because in the past, fires were allowed to burn or actually promulgated or promoted by some of the Native American <coughs> folks to um, control the vegetation, which is not what we've been doing, so that we increase the hazard by uh, moving into the wildland urban interface and knocking down fires, which otherwise would have been allowed to burn. Um, the issue for an architect is that what we have is usually a wind-driven condition where the forest or the understory becomes part of the uh, both a target and a source. And then embers are the are the element you're trying to resist along with the heat front that comes through from the passage of the flame front. Embers can then ignite things like fences, which then in turn can generate more embers and then ignite um, the building that's downstream of the forest or the underbrush that started the fire. So the targets become sources is the real issue. And you're dealing with um, embers and heat and radiant energy. And basically the basic wildland urban interface element is the other thing is wildland urban interface under the California 7A applies in state response areas where you don't have a local fire district or fire department. But as we found in some of the fires in the Berkeley, Oakland fire that I uh, came very close to experiencing personally and places like in Santa Rosa, where what looked like urban or, su or suburban or even urban environments were susceptible to wildfires so that they might not even have been in the 7A code zone, but they would have, those houses would have benefited from increasing their resistance by using the 7A provisions. So even though it may not be required by your design, you should think very strongly about incorporating the 7A um, exterior uh, condition requirements when you're designing um, houses or, res or any kind of com even commercial structures that might be susceptible to wildfire. Because basically we have encroachment of buildings into the wildfire prone areas. Site planning decisions are something where architects sometimes are downstream of those decisions, but when you participate, you wanna to talk to your client about where they wanna put their building. Um, people live in the woods because they like living in the woods. It's a very difficult discussion with a client to talk about defensible space because what you want to do is to make the forest that they want to live in not look like the forest anymore. Then there's an ongoing maintenance issue that goes with that. Climate change, as we, as we all know, is creating longer fire seasons, um, much drier climate, less moisture content in the fuels are much more susceptible to burning and creating those embers that we're worrying about. Um, sprinklers are really not a solution. There have been folks who have been promoting exterior um, sprinklers so they're wet down the outside of buildings. Um, the trouble is we don't have enough water supply to go down as it is. And if you had those sprinklers going off 
um, in a wildfire situation, you'd probably deplete the water source so that the first responders wouldn't have any water to deal with. Um, finding changes in the CBC is really just take a look at this later. This is really just a way of finding what's going on um, with new changes. Um, the state fire marshal has the ability under the California code to promote wildfire um, uh, regulations, which is where the 7A regulations come from under their purview over our occupancies. Um, 7A covers the wildfire exposure materials. Um, the purpose is basically to resist the intrusion of flames or burning embers projected by a vegetation fire that contributes to a systematic reduction in conflagration losses. That's the basic intent that's in the part of 7A. And, um, there are a series of sections in 7A that talk about the various elements of ignition resistant construction and prevention of intrusion of embers and um, radiant energy. The thing to keep in mind is there is a CAL fire. The State Fire Marshal's office has got, uh, has developed a pre uh, reviewed set of criteria that I'll, um, will allow you to uh, verify compliance with materials that you want to use with the State Fire Marshal's regulations. So it's very very good resource, and I would caution you strongly against using materials that are not listed by the State Farm Marshal, because you may end up having to test materials that otherwise would be just taken in the box. Um, Non-combustible exterior materials, is emission resistant. CLT, uh, which is a, a very popular new um, mode of construction with heavy timber laminate materials, performs like heavy timber. It's a very good um, sustainable design element, which is also fire resistant. Um, roofs, even things which you would think of as class A roofing, which is, is fire resistant, or even um, plate pile, can be susceptible to the spread of fire if uh, gutters are full of duff from the trees above, or there's bird's nests or certain things, or, and you need to think strongly about how you protect overhangs. Um, soffit details need to be paid very close attention to where you have overhangs that are projecting out beyond the wall, especially if you have um, uh, combustible materials. Um, double pane glazing, it also needs to have tempered glass so that there's a resistance to the thermal impact shattering. You need screens on windows, screens on skylights, and this, there's the contest in the code between fire and ventilation that there's a brilliant solution that people have come up with their intermittent code events, which allow ventilation, but then close up um, when you have a, uh, um, a fire. Um, projected um, elements need to be ventilated because of things like what happened in the Berkeley Rocky collapse. They also need to be sprinkled underneath. So it's, it's fire versus rot. Um, the other thing is you need to make sure if you're on a hillside, you're protecting from things coming up under the slope, um, that can come underneath the building. One of the latest provisions that came in the code just recently was the addition of weather stripping and prevention of um, embers intruding under things like garage doors, because any place that could be a thermal gap in the envelope could also be a physical gap that would allow um, embers to get into the building. And if embers get under the building or let the eaves on fire or set the subfloor on fire or collect in the corner of an uh, inside corner of a combustible deck, that's going to start a fire. And when you start the fire, particularly if it occurs under the floor or in the attic, you're probably going to lose the structure. Um, the California State Fire Marshal has a great website for the approved materials. If you don't have the code and you want to read it, there is available as a read-only and a completely up-to-date version that's kept on the California Building Standards Commission website. So I went through a lot of things very quickly, but we can talk uh, any questions uh, later. Oops. 
stop sharing. Thank you, Steve. This this, this is the element we intend to go down to that level of the detail. We call it really a, a, a brick and mortar type of approach. When architects carry a design for implementation, at some point, these issues you cannot avoid. Otherwise, there will be no design, no built environment. But this is a one kind of end of a perspective. And now we want to bring into uh, a different end of perspective is instead of resist, how can we work with the changing climate? And uh, that will be uh, you know, discussed by uh, Matthias that um, if we can launch uh, Matthias um, bio here would be nice, yeah. Um, so he put his entire career in address, as architect, in address resilient design, especially on sea level rise and flooding. And uh, like Steve and other panelists I worked with, and I know how passionate he is, and he really bring in a perspective that uh, we need here, uh, you know, clearly and how the industry has been, how architects in other parts of the world has been living with a condition as part of their design exercise to address the conditions that he's going to highlight. So um, he is, as I mentioned, a Dutch art, uh, architect and urbanist and a founder of architecture and urbanism. Uh, and it's award-winning firm that now practice in New York as well. He is the Rockefeller Urban Resilience Fellow for the University of Pennsylvania, uh, Stuart Weissman School of Design. And he work in the forefront, is a driving force to connect academians to designs and to also produce um, that most critical document, I call them, it's a curriculum for training chief resilience officers around the globe. And the initiatives are founded by Rockefeller Foundation 100 uh, Resilient Cities. So Matthias' office co-leads the big team to one that rebuilt by design competition for the flood protection of Manhattan and is currently actually part of multidisciplinary teams executing the first phase of the project they called East. Uh, sorry, I just sometimes have to keep pause because the questions and uh, and uh, and the chats block my screen. So so you just so you know, and uh, and it also working on the east side coastal resiliency project for the Lower Manhattan and as well as a planning for the Lower Manhattan's Coastal Protection Project. So he's really bringing the perspective of research and apply them in real architecture project. So he's also actually the building with nature. So with that said, I'd like uh, Matthias to showcase his work. And then, then after that, we perhaps can engage um, town hall session. Thank you, uh, Tian, for your nice words. And I'll quickly share my screen because I brought a um, lot of uh, slides. Uh, and here, here we go. So I'm not talking so much about the work that we do in New York. I'll talk a bit about some of the insights that we are uh, getting both from, from climate as well as from our projects um, globally. And there's a couple of things that I learned about climate recently, and this is an image of the heat wave in British Columbia uh, followed by an incredible storm is that on the one hand you might model things but the extremes of the climate crisis are, are really often outside of the bounds of, of what can be modeled and we need to take that into account. A second thing that, that I'm thinking a lot about is that everything that we design now um, will be part of a drastically different climate reality. And what we need to consider is uh, if everything that we design now 
is part of that different climate reality is how much time does it take to make the right decisions to get the projects uh, ready and in a rapidly changing world. And that's something that worries me a lot. And that's why I'm happy to be working on a lot of projects already, because we need to learn uh, how to how to do this work, uh, because, and this is a famous artwork in, in, in Berlin, uh, often nicknamed politicians discussing climate change. Uh, changing things is difficult, takes time, and often takes uh, too much uh, time. What I'd like to do today is to take you to a couple of projects, uh, starting in the Netherlands, in the metropolitan region of Amsterdam. You see Amsterdam here in the middle where we are, of course, in the Netherlands as a low country that has slowly been reclaimed from the uh, sea. We're dealing with a very complex system of how we manage our water. And that's a system that is increasingly coming under pressure in a changing climate. And that's also a system that, that of course, we, we, we need to live in uh, and we need to urbanize in. And, um, what we are seeing in this highly technical system that the Dutch have uh, developed, that where we might have our coastal protection in order, we have our uh, local climate adaptation not in order. Uh, part of the work that we, that we did in the Netherlands is to understand this system and, and realizing that where in the Netherlands we have different Folders, these components of the systems, these either uh, hydrological units need to start functioning uh, more independently from each other and, and are, should be able to manage their own uh, water. And th the way we went about it is by looking at the future climate impacts in the Netherlands and uh, looking at how you would mitigate those climate impacts. And for instance, if we would look at uh, water, uh, we need to retain a lot more rainwater from those rain bombs or cloudbursts that will be uh, coming. There's of course a host of solutions that you can use, but they come at a cost. And the more constructed these are, the less use of nature-based solutions, the more expensive we are. And as part of the research in the Netherlands, we, we looked at uh, one urban development uh, as an exemplary of, of many. We are not the designers of this. and said, how are we going to store the water now? And how are we going to store the water in the future? And we realized that adaptation to the amounts of water that might need to be stored within that system by the end of the century was going to be costly was going to cost increasingly more as we would have to build more constructed systems because our uh, lands to use nature-based solutions would run out and would often not even be sufficient uh, uh, for managing the water that we needed to be managed. And so we said what we are building up now is an incredible societal cost of not planning for these radically di different climates. And we need to learn how to rebalance our land use and our build up areas so that our natural areas can start to uh, perform a host of ecosystem services, not only in managing water, but also dealing with extreme uh, heat, with biodiversity loss and other stresses that come with the changing climate. And in order to work on that we developed for the city of Amsterdam a sort of new tool set in which we said if we want to develop our new urban developments climate proof we need to increase the amount of green space and with that also in order to balance increase the average height of buildings in order to uh, create a balance and when we would do that the end results would be uh, much cheaper and would provide many more benefits than, than the alternative, which is to use gray solutions. Part of that thinking was derived from a project that we did as part of the uh, Big One Sherwood team in the Resilient by Design competition in uh, the, the Bay Area, where we started to look at the area around Isler's uh, Creek, try to think about how we could protect uh, the port at the waterfront, but also restore 
the environment, uh, connect uh, resource flows with people uh, and, and the economy, but also grow the capacity of that area uh, for economic activity, but also grow it as a place that has a clear identity. And you might know this image, it was produced a couple of years ago, it will not come to fruition the way we think, but the idea was to use a, a large area of, of, of land and reimagine its land use and rebalance it with nature by uh, looking at the sort of low value land use that is there now, seeing how we could combine plots of lands, creating space for water, stacking existing use, uh, uses, maybe even add more programs and really creating uh, through that the, the ability for, for rejuvenating the economy of this area, but also rejuvenating nature in this. And we, we call this plan Hyper Creek, where we said we need to rebalance nature, industry, and people in this uh, area. And when doing that, we can reimagine our, our material flows. We can start to reimagine the way we deal with wastewaters and other, other things in this uh, 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 area. And that sort of set out that sort of thinking about how can we use nature a bit more in our urban environments, also understanding the extreme cost of gray infrastructure adaptation like we do on the coast of New York, uh, made us uh, explore much more building with nature as, as, a, as a tool set in order to adapt to climate. We of course have the sand uh, motor in, in, in the Netherlands where we dump a lot of sand on one particular place and let it uh, sort of disperse by, by the flows in, in, in the sea, uh, creating a host of ecological and recreational benefits. We are able to uh, construct uh, new uh, uh, islands in uh, the lakes that, that creates all kinds of uh, ecological benefits and allow us to restore uh, the ecology. And we thought these are the types of tools that we need, for instance, in this project in, in Amsterdam, where I'll take one of the, one of the sub projects of the resilient by design for the city of Almere, which is a city that is built on new land in the Netherlands, a polder that was reclaimed in, in 1967. Uh, in which uh, 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 there's a new housing development planned for the 2035, uh, 2040 of about 40,000 new houses. And our idea there is to say, let's pre-develop that using our natural systems so that by the time we uh, build our houses, we have a functioning and climate robust ecosystem in place. I think my son is ringing the doorbell, but he should have not uh, forgotten his uh, keys. So we can start by already uh, uh, using, uh, 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 placing sand in the right places, we can, and, and other materials, we can start to grow the ecologies that are necessary to manage water and to manage heat into the future and basically in, use the intermediary to prep this uh, land. That's is where we're going for this area. So this is the, the master plan as we have it now in which we've been looking at the different conditions that we find there. We've been looking at the different soil and hydraulic uh, uh, conditions and create a new plan where sectionally we start to uh, 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 redistribute the, the land and grow our ecosystems such that by the time we start building there, in 2035 or 2040, we have uh, the system in place to be climate robust. And so I think that's really where I wanna go. I think if we want to build climate robust cities, we need to think less in terms of gray infrastructure solutions. We need to think more in terms of land use and nature-based solutions so that we can combine not only the challenges of a changing climate, uh, uh, but also the challenges of the biodiversity, biodiversity collapse that is imminent. I'll stop here. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Thank you so much for bringing in the inside some of the concept um, uh, 
uh, materials may not be very familiar with to our architects here yet, but, uh, but we are so glad that you are here and uh, not just for this town hall and you insert yourself to the architecture practice from here, California, where you and I first met now to New York. So thank you for your contribution to the architecture profession. Uh, we now want really open up uh, the town hall, but uh, before we do that, um, Sarah, if I could uh, have the about this town hall slides back, so I can remind our audience, this is now opportunity open to them. Thank you, uh, Sarah. Uh, if, 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 if you recall, we started with introduce the agenda of this town hall, and we said we will showcase our speakers' expertise, and we then engage the theme of today, which is the role of architect, California architects in, um, in the resiliency, climate resiliency. But, a quick summary of our three speakers again. And uh, New Terra provides a broad overview. And I would like to say, uh, California is one of the most ready state that has mobilized in my past 10 years experience, all levels of a community engage this very important uh, concerns and a topic of California. For from a small cities, you know, um, um, uh, community groups to experts in universities, we are all united. We have many organizations, as you can see, when when I was introduced with my background. And uh, so, however, though we want to uh, pivot a little bit today, our discussion on architect and architectural practice. What is that? In this broader context, what does that mean to the profession and to the practice? So keep that in mind uh, when you start asking your questions. And um, if you look at the first three um, speakers, their topics, their you know, essence of their message is highlighted in this bullet point. And um, I want to mention the sea level rise and the flood adaptation. It was also ranked the top at, by the components survey I had mentioned, we put forth recently. And so it is a key concerns of our membership. So we choose that two topic by design and um, to, to engage this critical discussion. So with that said, um, questions start coming in. Maybe we can take a few more minutes to, to think about, uh, to let the audience think about their questions. I can start off with one or two questions for each of you. Um, uh, Nguyen Tara, I like to start with you. Um, um, you know, I'm familiar with your work and the great work have done at the state level, particularly put the strategy together for the, for the state. But if, if we um, put the design, you mentioned a few times the design uh, profession can do, but put this in context, uh, how, how do you see in the context of legislations and regulatory process that um, uh, we call the three R's, you know, resist, um, reconcile with the impact and, and retreat. How, how would these three E's that uh, as a policymaker or planner and, uh, and you envision a design professionals would contribute to that? Are you expecting architect will give you some resources about, you know, you had mentioned to design our housing so they can more fire resistant or you can hoping give 
uh, opportunities that the uh, architects contribute some of the broad data and the community design levels of uh, input to determine when, maybe where or when we want to retreat. So anyway, any perspective for your, for your work, how do you, what's, what's the insight you have in terms of you know, retreat, reconcile and, um, and, and resist? And, and uh, at, at this, you know, should we just, uh, everyone like Steve, go you know, design and, and develop a code or will we just, just go like uh, Matt, uh, Matthias that, uh, to, to design very long-term interesting project? But anyway, any perspective on that? Yes, great. Well, thank you so much for the um, thoughtful and important question. So I think there are um, two, two points that I would you know, raise here. There are obviously many more ways that you know, we need people, all sectors to be coming to the table and helping us identify you know, solutions. But I would share two here um, for this conversation. One is, you know, I think as we're really you know, recognizing the urgency of action in terms of adapting to the impacts that you know, all the speakers here have talked about that are affecting you know, California and beyond, um, we really need to understand how do different design actions provide measurable outcomes and solutions on the ground and being able to better understand in real time how those you know, different design features, different design elements are actually providing measurable outcomes is really helpful for us, especially you know, at the state level as we're thinking about how do we scale solutions kind of with the urgency of need that we have. And so you know, I think the you know, architects, designers, you know, really being able to share your expertise and insight on that level in real time is really important for us as we're trying to think about you know, making investments, policy, or other you know, um, code changes and really being able to have that evidence. So I think there's a real opportunity for bringing you know, partnerships together to be able to track and monitor you know, developing pilot projects, um, for example, and then being able to track and monitor um, and get that information to then scale broader solutions. The second um, piece that I would say is, you know, I think there's still a, a lot of work and, you know, as I mentioned in our office, issuing guidance to, you know, state agencies on how to incorporate future climate risk into decision making. One of the things that, you know, I'm not an architect, I'm not an engineer, I'm not a designer, you know, I, I don't work in that space. So one of the things we really need is to help translate many different fields together and understanding, you know, there's a lot of complexity of what it means to use forward looking scenarios around climate risk when we're used to using kind of backward looking single numbers to guide decisions. And so I think there's a lot of partnership and collaboration that can happen in that space in really thinking about you know, the complex challenge that it is to actually incorporate future risk and scenarios into our decision making, and especially then when it comes to building infrastructure, designing facilities, what does that mean on the ground? Because as was mentioned, you know, some of these design elements that need to be put in place to build resilience are very expensive. And so how do we start thinking about those, um, these solutions in, in existing um, contracts and structures? Um, constructs rather um, that we have in place. So those are two help help us understand how to translate future science into decision making and then to help share lessons learned of the benefits that different design interventions actually have in communities so we better understand how to scale those in our programs. Um, very well said. See if I can recap what you said. I think key phrase we really can uh, uh, I think deep here is at ground that uh, Neurotera used a few times at ground, at ground. Yes, we have in the past decade, uh, you, you probably agree with me, we, we oh. have really rallied the community throughout the California and make the awareness of resiliency 
is important to the communities and uh, many sectors um, being activity, activated. But one day from legislation to policy to building code, you know, Steve's building code, at some point is boots on the ground. How do we implementing that? And it, and it looks like you're in Terra indicating there is a opportunity there that um, the design professionals, architects, you know, can come in to play that role. And also from the scientific findings and the predictions to a policy statement, ultimately need um, um, interpretation of design language, right? What even what uh, resistance means without uh, Steve's going to highlight that building code and to the detail of event, um, the, the assessment understanding of resist is still very conceptual and limited, you know, to, to what extent you think you have resisted. So um, thank you for, for that insight. And uh, we have some questions come in. I, I like direct some questions first, and then uh, I may offer some of my own questions to you. So next one, I think the most suitable for actually for both Steve and uh, uh, Matthias to contemplating, which is what is the integrated living architecture path for the fire and water resilience in context between the natural system water management and urban interface wildfire and a no flammable uh, no Wi-Fi I think that's a good question so again we're talking about uh, living architecture that to consider the the water we have and the five water relationships and then if you recall the Steve mentioned a uh, sprinkler system may not be a optimal solution for fire resistant anyway, because we don't even know we have a sufficient water supply source. So I think this question hit this uh, pretty specifically. And uh, Steve, you want to go first, and then we have yeah, to hear um, Matthias' perspective. One personal anecdote, um, I noted that I was, for the first half day of the Berkeley firestorm in 91, I was in the direct path of the fire until the wind changed. Um, the other thing was that the fire water supply and actually the domestic water supply was crippled within an hour and a half of the start of the fire when the East Bay mud pumping station was engulfed in flames at the beginning. So if there'd been an, even a sprinkler system in place, it wouldn't have done anyone any good. So they were having trouble getting water to fight the fire. Um, but water is not the solution for wildland urban interface fires, unfortunately, especially in California, where we're, I think, what, a 2000 or you know, uh, centuries old drought, according to the Los Angeles area. Um, but in terms of, of resistance, you only have so much. I, I'd like to raise, I think, the question that also goes with with somewhere between resistance and retreat being related to each other is that when you're on the edge of the that wildland urban interface area where you can see the forest but you're not in it um, architects need to have a dialogue with their clients about where the buildings go this is also this is also the same dialogue i think that would occur in, in the edge of uh, the continent when you're dealing with with um, rising water uh, or seas is whether you know, if a beachfront house may not be the right thing or building on the edge of the forest may not be the thing that your clients should do in the long-term interest of their building. And that's a very tough conversation for an architect to have with a client to tell them that they can't do what they want. So uh, Matthias, among your remarkable works is look at the water um, um, use and water detentions and uh, migrations in long term is ever come to your design or come to your personal design mindsets that some of this water maybe uh, could be an interesting resource and reliable resource for urban wi-fi for example and anything close to that any insight i i i have seen very little that i mean it 
just takes a lot of water to put out a fire. And, and so, and, and I think th those amounts of water are, are not there. I think what, what we have seen, and I mean, that's of course a, a, a real challenge, right? Of how we deal with that societally is that there, there are two things that inform risk. One of them is vulnerability and the other is exposure. And there are many ways, and, 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 and uh, uh, Steve has, has given many examples of how you can reduce vulnerability by having better building codes. Um, there, the alternative is to reduce exposure and that's often a land use issue. And so many of the dilemmas you, you, you have and in, in talking to your clients, et cetera, is like, where, where do we go? Do we, do we go the reduce vulnerability route or do we go the reduce exposure route? And land is scarce, especially in California. There's a host of often also political reasons why uh, uh, land use is also extremely inefficient in the places where you, where you do, where, where, where the risk to both wildfires and, and uh, 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 sea level rise and, and storms is, is, is very limited. But in the long term, that's where the solutions are gonna have to uh, come from more from reducing exposure than from reducing the vulnerability, even though it is a real long way to go with all the existing uh, stock to uh, reduce the vulnerability. Okay, good. Um, New and Tara, you're always welcome to share if you want to jump in uh, on this particular issue. Otherwise, I can move to the next question. Okay. So next question is for New and Terra and uh, Matthias, and I think it's more for New and Terra as well. So infrastructure resilience is critical. It is a, this is an AIA event uh, with many architects attendance, and we very much appreciated knowing what we can do for buildings. And we believe buildings are very critical. So Steve has addressed that, but I think this uh, attendees are interested in a broader perspective. You know, does any weight and in any focus uh, or we approach to all any insight um, you want? Um, either you can start with. Maybe I put the new Terra first. Okay. Yeah, infrastructure would... versus beauty. Infrastructure versus beauty. Infrastructure versus what was that? Sorry. Yeah. Building. We, we have we have seen the folks on the building quite uh, infrastructure quite a bit. The questions um, behind the intent is how do we address buildings? Most of architects are working at building levels. They design buildings anywhere from remodel people's house to to you know be put a new portable building in a, in the elementary school campus things like that, so. Yeah, I would, um, I actually will maybe build on the point, um, Matthias, that you just raised around kind of vulnerability and exposure and the important kind of distinction there and then being able to, you know, and I really like your kind of framing of kind of the design and building codes for one and land use for another. And so I think, you know, I think that's a really helpful frame. One of the things we've also been working on, you know, through some guidance in our office too, is in addition to kind of understanding the right pathway to address different issues of vulnerability exposure, also understanding the difference, um, the different strategies that are needed for existing communities <clears throat> versus, you know, planned and new development. And some of those, um, you know, also we need to distinguish between the right strategies for design and, and land use in that space too. Um, so I'm not sure if that totally answered the question no, but, there, but yeah. I, um, I actually really appreciate that framing. Um, and so I think that that also responds to this question, but maybe I'll hand it up, um, Matthias, if you have other things to add. Yeah. There's, there's a number of, I, I, I think um, 
at a building scale if in responding to the climate crisis there's there's a number of elements that i think are really important of course if uh, a building is at risk uh, do everything to reduce its its vulnerability but but my uh, main uh, interest in at, at the architectural scale is in mitigation is like uh, make sure that the the resource and carbon uh, imprint of buildings is as uh, low as possible, as well as uh, buildings can play a great role in managing and recycling water uh, uh, locally. And I think there's fantastic techniques for that. Uh, uh, much of California has serious drought uh, problems. There is uh, for many places a real risk in having the water come from far away uh, places so, so finding ways to, uh, for instance, uh, retain water, use uh, uh, water recycling, building cisterns, uh, 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 etc., uh, and making sure that that uh, uh, the runoff uh, during a storm doesn't go to waste. I mean, you need some of it in order to 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 uh, keep your ecosystems functional, but you don't want too much of it going to waste. And there are real possibilities at the scale of the building and of the lot uh, uh, for, for um, having, having climate impacts and building climate resiliency. So um, thank you, uh, Matthias. My, my understanding of the question is uh, that the audience may concern that we, we may not strive a balance to address building base, building uh, scope level of resiliency versus infrastructure. Um, that, that is not my feeling, by the way. I think we are in the forefront. We want to address all. Um, it's, it's if you, you and Terra probably agree. Well, California approach to resiliency is really all scope and all, all depths, um, anywhere from social equity to design solutions. But nevertheless, uh, Steve, do you have any insight that uh, even the wide audience asks this question? Uh, do we have a perception or are we lacking in address building levels of residency? I don't know if we're lacking, but I think I've, I've gotten a window into this in the work that I've been doing in California with some seismic design considerations for resilience. Um, but it's also, I think it applies to wind design and even to fire design in terms of, you, I think you need to think of resilience in, on two levels, one on the individual structure level, but you also probably more importantly need to think about it on the community level because we've all seen those photographs of the one house standing in the midst of the devastation of a wildfire or a hurricane and being the last or the only house standing doesn't really do you a lot of good if the rest of the infrastructure has been destroyed. I think you need to look at this globally. You know, it's a conundrum between scales. You have to approach it at both scales. So I, I wanted, uh, uh, we all aware of, we always commonly called, you know, the resiliency transcends the scale, literally go vertical, you you know the, the horizontal does no end. It, more you engage, new Terra, you and I in the field ten years, maybe a few more decades, we still feel we are swimming in the bigger ocean. Actually, today's effort is different. We want to have some convergence. We we want to come back, become smaller, narrower, more vertical. So I just want to have that suggestion. Um, and we have a question pointed at uh, Matthias. I think we want to give this audience opportunity. Matthias, are there good international examples of natural and built urban environments which are roughly within California latitude, climate, and geographically, and relevant to California? Oh, that's, uh, that's a tough one. Let me... Um... Let, let, um, I would, I, I, I would really not know a, a very good answer. I think there's, there's 
partial answers that that we can we, that we can think about, right? I feel that for the the Bay Area, um, in dealing with sort of coastal risk and issues of sediment uh, uh, and, and and groundwater, there are uh, uh, quite a few um, uh, examples. Uh, for instance, in 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 in, in the Netherlands, uh, where uh, sort of sort of sort of learning to live with water uh, is something, and and I've saw some questions about amphibious living, uh, it can be really really uh, useful. I feel that for wildfire uh, risk, there are of course a host of practices, uh, uh, many also indigenous that uh, 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 are working really well. I also know that, for instance, in, on the East Coast, in the Carolinas, uh, they, the, the control, control burn strategies are uh, very, very effective. In, in a way, they're more advanced with that, it, it seems, but I, I'm an outsider in that than, 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 than maybe um, out West. Uh, we see a lot of uh, in, interesting techniques of um, uh, dealing with, with sort of water resources in uh, countries like, like Israel, uh, uh, but, but or, or, or elsewhere in, in the Middle East. But there's like, California is unique in, in the confluence of a lot of, a lot of things. It's also unique in, in how it's inhabitants and also the, the local capacity that is, that is, that is there. And, and honestly, I think California is, is more prone to lead the way in, in building climate resiliency and exporting its know-how globally than, than the other way around. Thank you, Matthias. Um, before we started the session behind the curtain, we talk about the potential question about when we're going to do the retreat. Yes, the question come in, so you know. Uh, this is for all three of you. Shouldn't the state and the localities be stopping construction at the wildland edge and the ocean bay river edge and use um, TDRs and dysfunctionals in infill urban? So the message is at some point, should we just retreat? And uh, if it is, when and where is this point? Any insight? Let's start with Steve. Uh, the reality of that has to do, uh, again, come back to the example of my experience with the Oakland Hills firestorm. The Initial thought was that we should have much larger lots. We should have uh, part of the problem was people were killed on narrow streets when they were trapped by fire, when they couldn't turn around. Essentially what happened in the rebuild of that firestorm area and in most of the rest of the firestorm areas in California is there was very little infrastructure change. There was very little lot size change. There was very little for forbidding of anyone to rebuild. So basically we have the same street arrangement that, that right now, if I go up the hill from my house, has existed pre-fire in 1991 because no one could afford to do the taking that would be involved to get rid of those lot splits. And the insurance company is gonna pay you to rebuild the house that you insured, not to pay for redistributing the lot um, this is a, it's, it makes perfect sense to forbid building. It is incredibly politically and legally difficult to do that. I will, this will be most challenging question for Nguyen Terra, so I save her for the last. Okay. Uh, Matthias, what is your perspective? Your, your projects are romantic. I always said you want to dance <laughs> with water, you want to live with water. And in fact, you might even own a house, uh, a riverboat house in Amsterdam that flows with water. But anyway, when are you, at some point, are you giving up? Are you going to retreat? So uh, eventually even the Netherlands will, right? But at the same time, I'm from the Netherlands 
much of the country is uh, uh, meters below sea level and we managed to live there. Hmm. And so, so it's very important to have a time horizon on, 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 on these things. You can protect yourself from water and wildfire, but it comes at a cost and it might not work forever. At least in the Netherlands, it will not work forever. And so from that time horizon and from the fact that, that, that there are significant costs to it, I think that there will be areas from which we need to realize uh, that it is good to retreat. We have choices to make. We cannot maintain everything as we do it now everywhere. So there are gonna be places where we're gonna retreat from and we need to start that soon because we need to build a practice around it. We cannot suddenly say, oh, now we have to retreat. Let's, let's, let's make sure that we have that done three years down the road. These are long processes. You have investment cycles to think about and, and stuff like that. So I think we, we're gonna have to think about that. I also think that, that for urban systems to function and for communities to function, there, uh, that let's say a wholesale retreat is probably not what you would want to do or what is really possible. So you have to think about what are the local conditions and what are places where you, where you uh, maintain and hold the fort for a bit longer. What are places that you can sort of let go now? What are places that, that, that you will have to start thinking about uh, moving away from or building in a very different way. It's very nuanced. It comes uh, locally. It is, it is really bringing like these different scales and these different time scales together. It will require a lot of very difficult conversations within communities. But I, at the same time, believe that the impacts of the climate crisis are going to be such that we are not going to be able to continue living as we are living now. Okay. Uh, Nur and Tara, so the question is actually pointed at you. Shouldn't the state, which is you, and the locality, <laughs> somewhat me, uh, you know, we are regional agency to stop? Looks like we have that power. Do we have that power? What's your view? Um, well, I would very much uh, build on the responses of my fellow panelists here on the screen um, today. I think there are some really important points that I just want to echo, and then I'll come to your kind of pointed question here, which is the importance of timeline and time scale is really important in these conversations. And I think that's where it does come down to, you know, local decisions around how do you provide a managed transition, recognizing the impacts that we're seeing in, you know, across the globe already. And that means, you know, having very, you know, as Matthias was saying, sometimes difficult, but very intentional conversations about where growth and development and where investments happen and at what time scale. Because I think sometimes the conversation around retreat has been either understood or presented as a kind of a black and white, you build today, you don't build tomorrow. And I think we need to transition to a much more nuanced conversation around what is the amount of risk tolerance and risk management we're willing to, that we can afford, that we're willing to take what are, when is that, you know, when do we hit a line where we're not? And then what are the solutions to respond to that? Because I think, you know, the, the kind of oversimplified conversation doesn't help us understand those trade-offs um, and also those complicated decisions. I would also say, at least from a California perspective, you know, there is no single spot in the state that is risk-free. So it's also about managing different risks and different thresholds at different times and figuring out how do we manage that? Where do we need to have risk avoidance and versus risk management strategies? So 
Um, I think you know there's obviously an important role that the plates the the state plays in terms of kind of setting the table, providing a framework for how we can think about these things. That's where, again, our guidance around how do you even start incorporating future climate risk into decision making comes into play. But also, you know, if in California, these are local decisions as well. Local governments have ultimate land use authority. So they play a really important role in a California context as well. So I think everybody has a role and we have to also figure out how to manage these very difficult, complex, um, nuanced conversations. Thank you. I, I think this, you can hear from very transparent, very um, 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 unmodified version of thoughts from three panelists. It is not a simple question when to retreat. And uh, if we know the answer, we will not need this town hall. So I hope <laughs> that uh, this is really bring me to the next, uh, Sarah, if we can bring into my closing remarks slides to have a challenge for you. If you realize we have limited time to answer all the questions, these questions are important start to shaping our understanding, our role, architect's role in this climate resilience. And uh, however, though, some of the remarks I think we want to hear and remember is, for example, Matthias had mentioned, California can be, uh, really have this opportunity to leading the process. And that we have been done doing this on many other fronts, on earthquake, on energy uh, uh, conservation. So this is our challenge now. And um, so since we are out of time, I may not, want, um, or maybe show one slide, uh, uh, Sarah, to, as, a, as just as a, a capstone for, otherwise I will be remiss, remiss to not showing some of the work that uh, from, uh, from Netherlands. So anyway, I want, I want you to consider today's conversation <laughs> as uh, just a start of a conversation and start to explore what is really architect's role and how do we come in to define it? And uh, no one defines us and we define for ourselves. This is the example that uh, uh, Matthias might be free, uh, familiar. This is uh, happening in, uh, in uh, Notre Dame. Uh, uh, no, 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 uh, how do you call it? Um, Notre Dame, the city. Mm -hmm. And it's a major freeway exchange. Then they convert the, the, below the freeway into uh, flood retention ponds. But the story is not stops here. They actually make this a public park. During non-flood time, you can use the space. You can see these housing stocks are uh, actually enjoy the space. And we have even sculpture. If you look at the right hand side, that's where architects and the design comes to play. The sculpture is an abstract one. Looks like parents hold the two children. If you look carefully, the retention high is about five or six feet. You look at the line beyond. So that's where the water line is. It is a fully in capacity. And you see that parents lift the two children above the water and with the spotlight shining down, a wonderful piece of artwork. And that is really how we should envision architects can help California design implementing resilient strategies with humanized solutions. We want acting as a winner, not a slave to climate change. And I think this project exhibits that spirit. So with that said, I want to thank all of you, particularly thank you to the speakers and, and attendees who are not AIA members. And I hope the conversation continues after this town hall. Thank you again. Thank you, Tian. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you again.